don't know what everyone is talking about. That stalactite does not look phallic. You people are perverts. It's the rare occasion that we see Nurse Chapel on the bridge. Apparently, the Enterprise is searching space for a lost scientist named Roger Corby, who just so happens to be Chapel's fiance. It's awkward when you consider not three episodes ago she was declaring her undying love for Spock. Have you ever been engaged, Mr. Spock? Turns out Corby is alive. Hooray! He makes contact with the ship and strangely requests that Kirk and Chapel beam down alone. Nevertheless, Kirk has two security guards come down with them. Three guesses as to who the dead shirts are in this episode. In the caves, they encounter Corby's assistant, Dr. Brown, or as Chapel calls him, Brownie. Brownie, where's Roger? Dead shirt number one down. He was pushed into a bottomless pit by... Lurch? Brownie acts weird and robotic, <coughs> and doesn't recognize Christine at first. As Kirk radios in Matthew's death to dead shirt number two, Lurch sneaks up on him and chokes him out. When Kirk, Chapel, and Brownie reach the science team's living space, there's a pretty girl in overalls and nothing else waiting for them there. Classy. She says her name's Andrea, and of course Chapel is immediately pissy because bitches be jealous, am I right? I don't remember Dr. Corby mentioning an Andrea. Meow. Corby appears and there's a joyous reunion between him and Chapel. Kirk tries to make contact with the ship after dead shirt number two doesn't respond, and Brownie pulls a phaser on him. Andrea tries to knock Kirk out, but Kirk disarms her and then does the most extra tuck and roll possible. He hits Brownie with a hand phaser and it's revealed that he was a robot. <sighs> I smell a robot. <laughs> Corby has Lurch call up to the Enterprise as Kirk. He seems to have that same mimicry ability that Juni Cortez from Spy Kids has. Mommy's mimicking me! Mommy's mimicking me! Also, I love that Spock can immediately detect that Kirk's voice sounds off, even if he doesn't realize that it's not actually Kirk he's speaking to. It just goes to show what a great command team they make and how well they know each other. Lurch, sorry. I know his name is Ruck, but I can't not call him Lurch, shows off that he can impersonate any voice, including Chapel's. This pisses Corby off, and he commands Lurch not to mock her or harm her in any way. Kirk quickly jumps in and suggests that Corby also command Lurch to obey Chapel no matter what. It's a clever move, trapping Corby in a corner and giving Kirk and Chapel an advantage. Unlike Brownie and Andrea, Lurch was not built by Corby, but by the extinct inhabitants of the planet. Corby is really keen on winning Kirk over. Kirk tries to make a break for it, but Lurch goes all Patrick Swayze on him. Corby then has Andrea demonstrate her talents for Kirk and Chapel. Yes, let's start with Andrea. I know a sex spot when I see one. Corby straps Kirk down to a circle thing that conveniently covers his junk and spins him around to create an android copy of him. I've asked my mad scientist friends and they say that's not how AI works, but whatever. It's just fun to watch Kirk and the Flom sex doll spin round and round really fast. Corby reveals that the android Kirk can even replicate Kirk's thought patterns, so Kirk, in another stroke of genius, starts thinking racist thoughts about the one person he knows would be clever enough to tell him from a copy. Mind your own business, Mrs. Spock. I'm safe with your half-breed interference, do you hear? Later on, Andrea makes lunch for Chapel and Kirk. Listen, fam, I'm not sure Andrea is really a threat to Chapel and Corby's relationship. Seems to me she's pretty interested in both of them. I am uh, now programmed to please you also. I mean, what couple would say no to a three-way with a hot robot? If you say you wouldn't, you're lying to yourself. At the end of the day, that's just gonna improve the relationship. Kirk asks Chapel if she would betray him if he were to give her a direct order, and she simply asks him not to make her choose between him and Corby. Kirk then reveals that he's actually the android copy, and Corby comes in with the real Kirk. Corby Kirk, Corby Kirk, Corby Kirk, Corby Kirk. <laughs> That's such a tongue twister. Eating is a pleasure, sir. Unfortunately, one you will never know. Perhaps. But I will never starve, sir. That could be read as a throwaway remark, but if you're reading ahead, you know that line is pretty loaded in reference to Kirk's backstory. Corby reveals that his goal is to perfect the human race by transferring their consciousnesses... Con consciousness... Consciousnesses? Conscious nigh, y you know what I mean, into android bodies, so humanity will essentially become immortal. Kirk compares him to different historical conquerors like Hitler, Julius Caesar, and Khan. No, no, Genghis Khan. Corby wants Kirk's help in starting the android revolution, but Kirk makes another break for it. Lurch chases Kirk through the caves, and Kirk tries to smash him over the head with the completely innocent rock, but is overpowered. In the struggle, Kirk nearly falls to his death, but on Chapel's instructions not to harm Kirk, Lurch pulls him to safety. Android Kirk beams up to the Enterprise and races 
just set Spock, who's immediately like, that's not my Jimmy, and alerts the security team. Andrea comes to visit Kirk in his quarters, and he kisses her in an attempt to confuse her circuitry, but she resists. Lurch reveals to Kirk that his original creators became afraid of the robots and started turning them off, and out of a need to preserve themselves, the robots killed their masters. Kirk points out that Corby is no different than them, and Lurch decides to rebel. He attacks Corby, and Corby destroys him. <laughs> Kirk injures Corby's hand, and it's revealed that Corby's a robot, too. Who would have thunk? Wait, if Corby's an android, then why was Kirk able to choke him out earlier? Do androids need to breathe? Because that seems like a severe design flaw. Why? Why was I programmed to feel pain? Andrea kills the android Kirk, mistaking him for the real one, and Kirk uses this as evidence that Corby's creations are not so perfect after all. Andrea reveals that she's in love with Corby, even though she's just a robot, and kisses him. Corby flips out and destroys them both. Spock and the cavalry arrive, and Kirk tells them that Corby was never here. The title of the episode takes its name from a children's nursery rhyme. What are little girls made of? Sugar and spice and everything nice. Obviously, this is referring to Andrea. Sugar and spice. The writer of the episode, Robert Bloch, was a prolific writer in the 20th century, whose best-known work was adapted into one of the greatest films ever made. <laughs> Block worked closely with H.P. Lovecraft in his youth, and there are some intentional references to Lovecraft in the episode. Lurch mentions the Old Ones, a conceit to the Great Old Ones, dead alien gods buried beneath the earth. Lurch's creators were forced to move underground when XO3's sun burnt out. It makes sense that Block's other two Star Trek stories, Wolf in the Fold and Cat's Paw, are the most Halloween-y of the series, since Block's first published stories were for the horror sci-fi magazine Weird Tales. Incidentally, Block also wrote the script for one of my favorite cheesy 70s horror movies, The House That Dripped Blood. But I'd be remiss if I made a video discussing a Star Trek episode about robots without bringing up Isaac Asimov. Isaac Asimov and Gene Roddenberry first met at the Tricon World Science Fiction Convention in 1966, where Roddenberry was screening Star Trek's second pilot, Where No Man Has Gone Before. Asimov interrupted the screening by entering the room in a noisy manner, and Roddenberry, not realizing who he was, shushed him. Someone in the audience shouted, You're dead! You just insulted Isaac Asimov! Asimov was pretty cool about it, though, and he and Roddenberry became friends later on, with Asimov even giving Roddenberry advice on how to make the series more successful. Asimov was one of Star Trek's biggest advocates with NBC, and it was he who wrote the famous Spock is Dreamy article in an issue of TV Guide in 1967. Asimov was the one who developed the famous Three Laws of Robotics. Number one, a robot may not injure a human being or, through an action, allow a human being to come to harm. Number two, a robot must obey the orders given it by human beings except where such orders would conflict with the first law. And number three, a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second laws. This episode deals a lot with those rules, and obviously it breaks them. Lurch goes rogue and murders his creators and Corby. He blatantly disobeys Chapel when she calls for him not to run after Kirk. The only one he does follow is number three. But what a lot of people don't talk about is the zeroth law, added to the list by Asimov in a later story. A robot may not harm a human being unless he finds a way to prove that ultimately the harm done would benefit humanity in general. So, I suppose Lurch gets a pass since forced eugenic biomechanics wouldn't really benefit humanity? Even though we know Lurch was really acting in self-interest. The episode also broaches the ship of Theseus problem with the plight of Roger Corby. The ship of Theseus is a thought experiment that asks the question, if you take an object and replace all its parts, is it essentially the same object? Now, let's save the discussion of the Aristotelian concept of essence for another time and focus on this question. Corby replaces his entire body with animatronic parts. Is he the same man? Well, Chapel would be the best judge of that since she knew Corby pre-robotification. And she says, Don't you see, Roger? Everything you've done has proved it isn't you. I think the doctor put it best when he said, You take a broom, you replace the hand. And then later, you replace the brush. And you do that over and over again. Is it still the same broom answer? No, of course it isn't. But you can still sweep the floor, which is not strictly relevant. Skip that last part. They're creepy and they're kooky, mysterious and spooky. They're all together ooky, the Adams family. Their house is a museum. When people come to see them, they really are a scream, the Adams family.